Hey guys, big question for you today. Is malnutrition a problem for the developing world or is it actually a global concern? And if it is, could milk be the answer? I'm Cheryl Fox and I work for the Carb Addiction Doc as a dietitian and diabetes educator. I work with people to adjust their food plans to improve their blood sugar control, which reduces the burden of chronic disease and can facilitate weight loss. But in a prior life, I was a biochemist. So when I think about any food, I want to think deeply about how our bodies use that food, both at the macronutrient level and down to the micronutrient level. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about milk. Milk is the most complex food there is, so I can't cover every aspect of the topic in one video, but today I want to focus on dairy as a food that might alleviate malnutrition. Abject poverty diminishes access to nutrition in many poorer nations, but there remain far too many people, even in developed countries, who feel its impact. There's global concern about how we can efficiently improve lives through better nutrition. Now, eating bugs may be an answer, but perhaps we might consider dairy. And lest you think that inadequate nutrition is merely a problem of those affected by lower income, let me tell you that sadly, that is not the case. Here in the United States, we have a crisis with what is termed by some as overnutrition. Now, I don't really like that term because it implies that as a nation, we eat an abundance of nutritious foods. That simply isn't true. In fact, the most recent statistics I could find reveal that approximately 60%, that's six zero, 60 percent of Americans' total caloric intake comes from ultra-processed foods. And this increases to over 70% in children and adolescents. Think about this another way. Even if you trust the U.S. dietary guidelines, we consume those whole foods less than half of the time. Now, we can save for another day the debate about the validity of the recommended daily allowances of nutrients, as well as any discussion about whether my plate is the optimal way to eat. Today, I really want to focus on nutrient loss due to ultra-processed foods. The my plate visual is what the USDA recommends as an optimal meal. This simple model is designed to make it easy for consumers to see what an ideal meal should look like without too many restrictive details. Your plate should be half filled with fruits and vegetables and the other half filled with a lean protein source and preferably whole grains. On the side, you see a glass of low fat dairy, although they mention that fortified soy alternatives are acceptable. The key point is that the emphasis is on whole ingredients, both unprocessed and minimally processed foods. This visual shows us how Americans actually eat. As a whole, we follow the dietary guidelines about 40% of the time and eat ultra-processed foods about 60% of the time. Generally speaking, the NOVA system is used to classify foods into four categories, minimally or unprocessed foods, culinary ingredients, processed and ultra-processed foods. These ultra-processed foods, or UPFs, Encompass foods that have been industrially manufactured, include additives, and have a long shelf life. Another way to think of UPFs is that although you might be able to make something similar in your own kitchen, you would not easily have access to some of the ingredients they use or manufacturing processes that are used commercially. So, for example, instead of steak, you might instead consume a protein bar. These so-called foods dominate our food supply. Dr. David Kessler, former commissioner of the FDA, observed rising rates of chronic illness and obesity, which prompted him to write his book, The End of Overeating, Taking Control of the Insatiable American Appetite. He notes that when the mix is right, food becomes more stimulating. Eating foods high in sugar, fat, and salt make us eat more foods high in sugar, fat, and salt and a large and growing body of evidence has consistently linked overconsumption of ultra-processed food to poor health outcomes. The CDC ranked heart disease as the number one cause of death of Americans in 2021, even with a confounding issue of COVID. All causes, with the exception of accidents at number four, are at least tangentially related to food choices. 
In an interesting 2021 paper by Kevin Hall and others, we learned that when compared to unprocessed or minimally processed food diets, those consuming ultra-processed foods typically took in about 500 extra calories per day. According to Dr. Kessler and others, we might conclude that ultra-processed foods are irresistibly palatable, so we can't control our intake. I can mostly agree with that, but what if there's something else going on in addition to our craving for dopamine rewards? Simpson and Robenheimer developed the protein leverage hypothesis, which postulates that humans adjust their food intake to maintain a relatively constant dietary protein intake and consequently will have higher energy intakes on diets with low protein density. All right, that's a lot of fancy words. What they're trying to say is that as humans, we have like a daily protein target that our bodies are striving to meet. And so we're going to eat and eat and eat until we hit that target. So if we're eating ultra processed foods, like let's say a donut, we're going to have to eat a lot of them to hit that protein target. In other words, we're going to have to consume a lot of calories or energy to hit that protein need far more than say if we were eating a ribeye, which will require fewer calories, less energy to hit that protein target. So this hypothesis has been put forward as an alternate explanation for the obesity epidemic, especially if a person is eating more of those donuts than they are ribeyes. But what if instead of trying to meet protein needs, our increased appetite in the face of ultra-processed food was to meet critical micronutrient needs instead? You see, our bodies are actually pretty efficient at recycling protein, but we're far less able to recycle many of the vitamins and minerals we need, so we require a regular supply. You see, I kind of like this protein leverage hypothesis. I just want to flip it a little and consider it from the point of view of perhaps we're needing some vitamins and minerals instead of proteins. That is, we're looking at things now on a micronutrient level rather than on a macronutrient level. To explore the micronutrients that might be missing in our modern diets, I used the app Chronometer to compare a typical 2,000 kilocalorie diet following the dietary guidelines versus the reality of our diets. I realize that the dietary guidelines are purposefully vague about specific food choices, but I follow the spirit of their guidance to illustrate a meal plan that adheres to their guidance. Next, I created a meal plan with the same caloric intake but with 60% of those calories coming from UPFs instead of whole unprocessed foods. Then, I compared the recommended dietary allowances, or RDAs, with how much of several micronutrients were consumed with each diet. Compared to the dietary guidelines, there is a reduction in micronutrients, particularly vitamin D, calcium, and magnesium. These are of particular concern given how they interact to maintain skeletal density and cardiac health, both critical for healthy longevity and quality of life. Remember how earlier we saw that heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. You may have noticed that I included dairy products in both scenarios. Dairy is recommended by the USDA. Of course, this remains controversial, with many critics noting that the dairy conglomerate lobbied heavily to have it made part of the dietary guidelines. While this may be true, where else should one turn to get the micronutrients found in dairy? Beans, seeds, tofu, and leafy greens contain calcium and magnesium, but they also contain anti-nutrients that bind these minerals and prevent their absorption. The bones in canned salmon and sardines provide minerals, but many people don't find these very appetizing. Of course, one can purchase fortified foods and beverages or pop some vitamins, but one always comes back to wondering if these vitamins and minerals in isolation are really helpful. And one thing many people overlook is the fact that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. Well, actually a pro-hormone, but the point is, is that it needs to be consumed with fat in order to be absorbed. That comes easily from fatty fish or full-fat dairy, but not so much from spinach. And of course, I always advocate for sunlight as a natural vitamin D source, but I realize that's not possible or feasible for many people during some parts of the year, so supplementation can become important. But milk is a great way to get that vitamin D, and it comes nicely packaged with calcium. So, dairy! A single cup of milk contributes nicely to your daily micronutrient needs. 
or if you prefer, there are many other dairy options such as kefir, yogurt, cheese, cream, and butter to name the most popular and common options. The FAO definition of food security states that food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Worldwide, and for the last 9,000 years of our history, milk has been an important source of nutrients and there are many efforts underway to encourage milk drinking throughout the developing world. As a relatively inexpensive and concentrated source of macro and micronutrients, milk and dairy products can play a particularly important role in human nutrition in developing countries where diets of poor people frequently lack diversity and consumption of animal sourced foods may be limited. The food insecure people in the world subsist on staple diets consisting mostly of cereals. While these do contain some protein, many of the micronutrients are poorly absorbed, leaving many in the population deficient in one or more vitamins and minerals and vulnerable to illness as a result. So it would seem that dairy could alleviate malnutrition in the developing world, and it could also enhance micronutrient density in the developed world. To reap all the benefits, I recommend full-fat dairy. In fact, Dr. Sivas frequently refers patients to me when he believes they need to increase dietary fat relative to dietary protein in order to optimize their metabolic health. And of course, one of the tastier ways to accomplish this is with dairy products. In fact, dairy is typically included in most variations of restricted carbohydrate plans. And so dairy can be a positive contribution even to those who are food secure. And yet dairy is a rather controversial topic no less today than throughout all of human history. Most of us consume it or don't without really giving it much thought. Today, I've only scratched the surface of other things we can talk about where dairy is concerned. So I hope you tune in to upcoming videos where I delve deeper into all things milk. Thank you for watching. As a scientist, I like to say that I don't breathe without a reference, so I hope that you find these useful if you want to dig a little bit deeper into the things I've spoken about today. Thanks again, guys.